60% of the lamb that we consume here in the United States is actually imported, which doesn't make sense since lamb is being raised in every state across our country. It doesn't have to be a special occasion dish. It's easier than you think, and it can be something easy to whip up on a weeknight. And by doing so, you're supporting American farmers and ranchers. When you menu local lamb, you are supporting the nation's shepherds and their families. Call out fresh, homegrown local lamb on your menus. Good afternoon, everyone. We appreciate all of you for tuning in today to focus on the American lamb butchery presentation. Now, more than ever, it's important for culinarians to connect, to share, and to offer inspiration and mentorship, which, exactly, which is exactly why we are excited to be here just for you, the leaders of the food service industry. Before we begin, as a note, we will be taking questions from you, the viewers, as we are able. Please use the chat function to collaborate with other viewers and the Q&A function to chat with our special chef. Let's start off with a quick audience poll. How experienced are you with whole lamb butchery? Using the poll function, submit your answers. My name is Ashton Garrett. I'm the president of the ACF Young Chefs Club, and I'm excited and honored to be, in, to be introducing today's featured guest culinarian. Chef and business consultant, Mark Denitis is a pioneer in the world of modern butchery, charcuterie, and salumi. Chef served as a culinary educator and chairs person of the meat cutting curriculum at Johnson & Wales University from 2000 to 2010. While there, Chef helped the American Land Board develop culinary education videos and step-by-step -step fabrication sheets. In 2011, he founded the Rocky Mountain Institute of Meat. Chef Denitis has also owned and operated Mondo Vecchio Salumery. Most recently, Chef has worked as center of the plate protein specialist for Cisco in Denver, as well as corporate chef, sales manager, and consultant for various meat companies, including Neiman Ranch. Thank you for joining us. At this time, I will turn it over to Chef Denitis to fabricate an entire lamb carcass. I'm sure he will inspire all of us to think about new ways of menuing American lamb cuts. Chef, without further ado, please, thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to be here presenting to the American Culinary Federation on behalf of the American Land Board, the American farming and ranching communities found in all 50 states across America. No matter where you source your lamb, be it distributor or direct from the farmer or rancher in your nearest community, reach out and be considerate of how it's going to work best in your operation. Um, what we have here is a uh, carcass that's been split. I've gone ahead and actually uh, split it into quarters. So we've got our fore saddle and our hind saddle. We're going to start today in the uh, fore saddle by uh, fabricating the uh, shoulder and then the rack. And then we'll move back into the loin section and full leg breaking it down into the various cuts. And today, what we're gonna do also is, I'm gonna kinda go by shoulder, uh, a couple of easy ways that you can fabricate this in your operation, taking into consideration a couple of factors. Do you have the labor? Does the labor you have, have the skill and the time within your daily shift and daily operations? And do you have the customer base that would appreciate and uh, benefit from doing these different cuts. Now, that's not to say you have to bring in a whole carcass because the various cuts, as I'll speak through the entire animal, uh, can be purchased just as is. If you just want some square cut shoulders, you can do that and fabricate it in a, in a fashion that works best for your operation. And that's the thing as chefs, we have to be fiscally responsible, and that pertains to the food cost, but labor cost, and all those other things while fulfilling our uh, goals of being a professional culinarian for ourselves and our teams. So without further ado, I'm gonna pull this uh, four section off here and talk about this a little bit. We've got our, our, our shoulder piece here, and our rack, and if I'm gonna flip this over, as we can kind of see a, almost a mirror image here, um, I'm gonna break these 
down in two different fashions. Uh, one will require a, a saw, which right here, just a basic saw that can be ordered online or through some of your local distributors, equipment suppliers and such. Uh, we're gonna separate uh, on this one first. I'm gonna go ahead and separate the breast from the rack and the shoulder section. Uh, first, I'm gonna take off at the uh, shank portion here real quick and take off that right there. Put that in my bone pile. And uh, here, we're gonna make a, uh, I'm gonna make an incision just to give me a line or guide to go by. Uh, right above the joint in the forearm, basically the equivalent of your elbow. I'm gonna make a cut and then into the brisket. Down below that is where the brisket or pectoral is. And then across uh, rib bones one through 12 in that fore saddle. The 13th rib bone is gonna be found in the hind saddle at the loin. So I've made my markings here. This is a more classical cut, uh, following along with the meat buyer's guide. There we go. Get a nice clean cut. Set that aside for the time being. This here. Of course, we'll take our shank. Great for slow cooking. And that's the other thing you want to think of as we break down the animal, or really any animal, with your outer or working muscles, slow, low cooking techniques and methods, doing braising or barbecuing, great for shredding, great for uh, ethnic dishes, street food style, and things along those lines, going beyond something of just the standard braised shank. Now with this piece here, basically what we have is a small little brisket or pectoral piece, and then the equivalent of a short plate, if you will, or belly. Oftentimes you'll see this is great smoked as a whole piece or done into riblets, the Denver rib. And there's cartilage kind of down in here, so I'm using my cleaver to really work into that. And the other, instead of doing individual riblets, we could actually cook this whole. Another thing that we can do, we've got the uh, outside and or outside and inside skirt. That would be found in other uh, animals in the same uh, region in a short plate or what have you in the breast of, of a lamb here. So this is a nice squared off piece, something like this. We could uh, rub down with a dry rub or marinate it to a quick grill and then portion it uh, for ease of the guest of consuming it. Uh, we could also uh, braise that and do braised riblets and such. Another thing we could also do is come underneath and just simply follow the bone. And if we wanted to do some more advanced charcuterie work, uh, one of the general rules of, of butchery is simple. Follow the bone. When there's no more bone to follow, follow natural scenes. So what we have here is basically a boneless uh, breast or the equivalent of, of belly, if you will. So we could make a pancetta 
or a bacon if we were doing more advanced techniques of curing and smoking and things along those lines. Get a couple of these riblets here and just gonna put those there. So the breast and foreshank are really kind of a subprimal or secondary cut of the shoulder, even though a portion of that does come from below the rack. We'll get back into that in just a moment. In this fashion here, we still have our shoulder and our rack. And we are gonna split that in between the fourth and fifth rib bone. So I'm gonna count from the first, second, third, fourth, and just cut down low. There is a shoulder blade right in there where my knife is hitting now. Just with a quick cut, that goes through like so. Set the rack back over for just a moment. One of the things that especially popular uh, chefs out there who are at country clubs or hotels as we get back into doing events and creating fun stations or in our dining areas, uh, family style, uh, tables of 10 or 12, something like this can be very easy to achieve. And in this instance, I'm going to take the whole shoulder. I'm going to come underneath the the rib bones here and work my way up towards the spine. And again, using the weight of the lamb to hold it on the table, but I'm also coming right underneath following those rib bones, lifting it up as I go, and then working up towards here, towards the spine. And again, it's all about following the bone. So as we do that, there we go. Up in the neck. The neck is the most challenging part because there's a lot of nooks and crannies. There we go. And one thing we can do is just square this off, take a little bit of that neck piece off. Put this with some of my edible lean and fat trim. And this is nice too if you, if you have a grinder. You have a lot of opportunities to do grind, but if you don't have a grinder, it's really simple to buy economically fresh ground lamb to prepare free form sausages without the use of a stuffer and to get it into intestines. You can do kind of patties or quenelles and different things along those lines. So one of the things I like to do, we know that bone adds flavor. Now we've got this whole roast. We do have the arm bone which comes down through there. And we do have some of the blade bone down underneath here. And for a great presentation, we're gonna just kind of cross hatch this, make some nice little diamonds there, like so. And then we can season this on the exterior and the nooks and crannies and all that. And then simply take the rib cage like so. A little bit of our butcher twine here. And just to secure that all in place. And what's nice if you wanted to do some uh, flavorful aromatics, fresh herbs, or uh, mirepoix, rough cut, pancasse, or what have you, underneath that rib cage to add additional flavor, you can do that as well. Quick 
old school butcher's tie real quick right here. Again, we're just doing this to hold it in place. Flip that. Right. Over and under. Another quick over and over. Back to where we started here. Come around like so. I'm going to simply tie that off. Something like this. Also, if you wanted to get really fancy, is great for doing uh, live fire cooking stations and such, where we have a hook and can kind of hang that above some coals and just let that spin and roast slowly. Otherwise, we can put that on a roasting plaque and uh, just slow roast those in the oven until it's fork tender. Start off at a really high heat and then drop it down low. So that's one simple way. And again, we want to think about practicality, what's relevant, what's applicable in your environment with your staff, your kitchen, and your customer demographic. So in this other application, before I get onto the rack, we're gonna go ahead and count again, one, two, three, four, five. One, two. Mark that off. This instance, we're gonna get a full hotel rack where the breast portion is still attached. And I'll come back to the reasoning on that as well. Some different cuts that we can get for our shoulder. That'll make some really nice opportunities. So we've got a standard cut rack and the hotel rack where it comes all the way down, including those breast cuts. Here, again, I'm gonna separate this. And again, with the shoulder, get that shank portion out, have some more that breast for smoked brisket. Again, with our shank. Now here, um, you can purchase a variety of arm chops and lamb chops. Uh, blade chops would come from the above the spine portion and be cross cut this way. Down below, we cross cut this way and it have a piece of the arm bone in there. In this instance, I'm gonna go ahead and leave the bones in, and we're gonna get some great braising and stewing cuts out of this. I'll first take it off my neck. Right there. I, now there's a lot of meat on there. I'm gonna split that, because I could probably get two really nice orders. You can purchase whole, whole necks as well to do this. Cross cut, they kind of give the, have that uh, ashibuko appearance. So we've got some great neck pieces there. And as I said, you have the arm and the blade. I'm going to separate the arm from the upper portion of the shoulder. The ribs, here we go. And these make great individual roast as well. We're going to separate these even further. Get some great braising and stewing cuts. And factor in too that when you're braising, stewing, or slow cooking, such as barbecuing, you're going to lose upwards of 25 or an additional 30% of shrink from cooking. 
So we've got an arm chop there. I'm gonna cut another one out of this piece. And out of here, we'll get another couple of thick cut shoulder blade chops. And as, as nice and quick as a bandsaw might be, um, the liability potentially, <laughs> it may be a little concerning. So a, a simple, saw like that works just fine. And this would be the, if they call maybe the seven bone, siete bone roast, because you have the number seven from the shoulder blade in there. So we've got a couple of different ways of doing that shoulder. Now I've got easily four, five. a couple of cuts that can be served whole. And remember, as that cooks and shrinks, the bone will expose itself. So for great plate presentations. Here on this rack, we're gonna do a more traditional style cut and we're gonna keep it rustic. Um, a couple of things in cleaning that up. We've got this uh, elastin tendon here kind of holds everything together. It starts in the neck and comes all the way back. It's a little yellow in color and will not break down in the cooking process. Put that with the bone and add that to our stock. Okay. And most often times when you're ordering from your uh, distributors, you're probably getting a chined rack and chining means or refers to removing this triangular shaped portion of the spine. That's usually cut off on a bandsaw and, <laughs> and, uh, and then you have your rib chops. The other thing we wanna take off, I'm gonna go ahead and take out a little bit of the, uh, this remaining shoulder blade piece. And this is kind of the scapula see here, there we go. And this kind of uh, is the meat version of a, a plastic bench scraper, a bowl scraper. You certainly wouldn't want to do your baking and pastry with that unless it was savory maybe. I'll put that over there. And I'll take off a little bit of this fat here. Now the, this food dye, is just that. It's a simple food coloring that has grade on it as well. Uh, the yield. Uh, lamb grades are different than the yields, but they both in part play a factor in its overall USDA grade. Most graded lamb is going to grade out at uh, uh, prime and choice. I'm going to do a little bit of a quick Frenching. We've got some of that fat cap there. There's a nice little piece there. Something like that could be cured as well. I'm gonna done into a bacon style back there. And then simply uh, like so. And depending on you're gonna menu it, if you roast them whole and then portion them out. Got our lamb rib chops. And in this fashion here, we're gonna do a double.
come back and clean those up just a little bit. A little bit better angle at them. Of course, you can wrap those with a little foil before cooking. Keep those bones nice and clean. I'll leave the fat cap on there in this instance. As I said, do this a little more rustic. Okay. My rib fingers, that makes for great grind or sausage. You can always come back and pick through and separate the lean and fat further. So if you wanted to do stew, Here I'm going to take the outside skirt first. Okay. Here we're going to separate this just where the cartilage turns to bone on that. And again, we've got some more or a breast piece here. Uh, we could do rib tips with this. Uh, again, barbecue these and divide these up into little riblets, uh, what they were, might refer to as uh, little Denver ribs. And here, we're gonna get uh, some tomahawks. Come underneath here and get a little bit of that. There we go. So right in here, where I'm running my knife, there's a little bit of a yellow strand. That's that little piece of elastin. Cut that out. Shave off a little bit of that ink. And most consumers would kind of question that purple or blue on my, my meat. Usually that would render away, but to avoid any yeah, customer dissatisfaction. Maybe some double double tomahawks. And just for purposes of keeping that nice and straight, just do a quick hit with that saw. We've got these large, double thick uh, tomahawks. And one of the things that we can do also, there's a cut, uh, Latino style cut. It's called a can can. Explain another species, but just cut across a single strip like that. So that kind of opens up for presentation on a plate. Or we can do some cross hatches. Score that. Excuse me, Chef, can you hear me? Yes. Great, great. Um, I just want to, this is a fantastic presentation. We're getting a lot of great commentary and, and feedback. So thank you for, for showing us how to fabricate a, an entire lamb carcass. Um, I just want to let you know we are at the 30-minute the mark, so you, you're right on track. You're doing a fantastic job. Um, we just had a quick question, um, if you wouldn't mind. Um, uh, Chef, 
Jackson asks, uh, does using the bandsaw reduce the tenderloin, uh, I, I would assume in size or fraction and removing that chime piece that you had mentioned earlier um, in fabric? Well, yes, there is a much higher concern when using a bandsaw of cutting into that eye loin, that ribeye or that loin, or even the uh, tenderloin as we move back into the animal. But certainly the largest concern from a processing standpoint outside of losing a finger um, would be cutting into that uh, loin eye a little too much one way or the other. Great question. Thank you for that information, Chef. We Certainly. appreciate that. Here, I'm just going to take off the little joint and just give this a nice straight edge there. And talk about the uh, different cuts here. Um, one of the factors in, in lamb, in grading lamb, besides looking at the uh, face of the loin eye at the 13th rib or in the rib of the rack on that 12th uh, last cut there, if it were, there we go. So where it separates after the 12th, it'd look at the marbling in, the, in that face of the rib eye, uh, as well, look at the fat streaks in the flank. This is the actual flank steak. Very small in comparison to some other species. And we're going to do some uh, cool classical things with uh, that as we uh, cut through this. Uh, one of the things I want to do is separate the flank out a little bit here, just where that point is. I'm also going to where the, my finger is here, there's the H bone of the, the hip that the tenderloin runs along. Let me take this little artery out and remove some of that. There's the hanger steak actually, again, quite smaller than some of the other species. Little tender morsel is the chef's bite or the sous chef's bite, little treat. Um, in trimming some of that fat away, we've got our tenderloin on this side of the spine. And then on the other, the contrafilet there, the uh, strip loin. So one of the things we're going to do first, I've peeled back the, the flank. And right in the uh, sacral region where the, basically the tail portion comes out, we're going to separate the leg, the full leg, from the saddle, the loin, if you will. And actually, before I do that, I am gonna peel back the tenderloin and do that by following down in the hip bone here. There we go. Let's help peel that back. There we go. So I'm gonna do a neat uh, application with a boneless loin and tenderloin. So we don't want to chop that off. Great cut, that aside. In this instance, I wanna trim my thin meat. That includes the flank and some of this skirt here that comes from the breast portion and goes back into that loin. And just do a nice little straight cut right to the 13th rib bone right there. Set that aside. And then I'm gonna, out of this one, I'm gonna peel the tenderloin out by simply following along the spine. And again, follow the bone. Make 
trim up some of that fat. And I'm gonna keep that tenderloin hole, including the chain on there. And then what I'm gonna do is remove the uh, loin by coming on the opposite side of the feather bones and the 13th rib bone here, the hip bone on this side. What we've just removed is the T in the uh, porterhouse or T-bone that you would find right there. Let's set this over in our bone pile. And then I'm gonna remove a little bit of this fat. I'm gonna do a boneless version of a T-bone and porterhouse. I call it, uh, typically you would just do the loin in an application where we use the term noisette or coin-like. Set that in like so, trim that just a hair down. We can season the inside of this. Take a little bit of this off. Butterfly this open just a hair. Fit that in there. trim. In this application, I'm not gonna do a continuous tie. I'm gonna do it individually. So. And Chef, uh, why is it important to do it individually? In this instance, um, be it for portioning, uh, as I'm gonna do, or if we're in retail, where I was making a, a uh, uh, roast that say somebody would come in and didn't want to buy the whole thing, then it can easily be portioned without ruining that tie. And that way, something like this, you can do on a station. Wow. Uh, grilled uh, boneless T-bones or porterhouses or boneless noisette. If we were roasting it whole and then going to carve it, I might do a continuous tie and take off that sure. later. 
Chef, the, uh, the questions are, are filling up tremendously. So if, I, uh, if this is a right time, I'd just like to ask you, we have a chef that uh, asks, what spices are good for lamb that you use in your, oh, in your kitchen? You know, uh, the good old standby, uh, probably uh, rosemary and garlic and black pepper are some of my favorites. Uh, of course, you can get into the smoked paprikas and harissas and different flavors of Morocco and North Africa, things along those lines. Uh, a great resource for that also is the uh, curriculum found on the American Lamb Board website where they've got great information for pairing not only spices, but also wine Wonderful. and other flavors. And here I'm coming underneath the tail, working towards the H, uh, the uh, uh, hip bone under here. This is probably my least favorite part because there's kind of some odd nooks and crannies in there. There we go. Just working towards that joint. There we go. Take that out, trim this large piece of fat up here. Chef, we're about a, uh, 15 minutes out in the presentation. This is one of Perfect. our questions. So I just continuing to follow in. Um, I think a lot of people are viewing the curriculum uh, presentation as well. Uh, so we just have another question, more of a, a general um, question. Um, what types of uh, butcher's knives or sets do you recommend uh, for starter chefs and then also heading into more professional? Excellent, uh, Excellent question. Uh, one of the simple things is a semi-rigid or semi-flexible curved or even a straight knife. Uh, as well, something a little longer like a staker or sticking or a European style butcher knife for portioning, uh, which a chef's knife, 10 inch or 12 inch would work just great for portioning. Whereas a smaller knife such as this is more for that detail work. Here we've got a, a sirloin roast. I'll do a, a continuous tie on. There we go. That nice, and again like so. Get those nice and even. And Chef, um, in, in your personal opinion, how do you think we can structure the industry into uh, producing sustainable lamb and, and moving forward into educating others into producing sustainable lamb? Like how, how integral or integral is that relationship between the farmer and the, and the, uh, the consumer? You know, I think we've seen that grow tremendously over the past decade and a half. The popularity of craft artisan butchery from 2005 uh, onward to today uh, has, has grown tenfold. The one thing that I think uh, has happened through COVID, uh, obviously it's a challenge getting uh, staff into our establishments sure. um, and the time commitment to doing some of those things has, uh, has uh, some limitations. So again, asking yourself those questions of what's gonna be practical, what's gonna be relevant in my operation and applicable. Do I have the staff? Does the staff have the time, the labor? Do I have the environment to fabricate things safely as well come into play? And I know you mentioned it before throughout the presentation, Chef, and, and just in saying that, okay, does it make sense in the operation? Is it, you know, like you said, mentioned, um, is it applicable? Um, is, is the staff well-skilled and trained? This brings me to my next point. What kind of trends are, um, do you see or are, are, uh, are potentially foreseeing with lamb? Like what, what, uh, what are some now, things I out think, there? Uh, oh, that's a great question. A lot of the popularity is coming with the economical valuable cuts Right. Or value cuts, uh, leg, shoulder, and especially grind. Uh, grind is something that's easily ready to go out of the package, you can do your own creations, get really innovative, and uh, 
and have some fun with some of those things and, and, and at the same time, educate your customers. Thank you for that, Chef. Yeah, educating your customer, I think that's the, the that's name true. of the game, I think, for, for all of us. Um, as we have the ability, we also have the responsibility as chefs and, and uh, just pioneers of our industry, masters of our craft. So what are you working on now, Chef? Uh, I've got the leg portion here, what we call the shank half. I uh, took apart and did the boneless uh, sirloin. I'm going to cut a flat cut on a shank portion here and separate that so we have a whole roast. We have a whole flat cut shank that can stand up real nice. In this instance, we're going to do a uh, boneless leg. I'm gonna, there's a white seam that kind of follows along the uh, femur bone. And I'm gonna separate those muscles. There you go, come down the other side. It's kind of like if you're thinking of a chicken thigh almost. Oh, okay. Removing that femur, working away around the, the knee joint. And the kneecap here. Chef, we're, uh, we're about 10 minutes out. It's okay if we, if we go a little a little over. These are This is a tremendous presentation. So thank you so much for, you. for doing this. Um, Chef Johnson has a question. Uh, how much lamb is raised in Colorado? Uh, there's a lot of lamb raised in Colorado. It uh, has a great environment throughout the entire Rocky Mountain region, really. Um, but there is lamb in all 50 states. Here we go. I've got the top round or inside inside round of your leg. And then we're gonna separate the knuckle or sirloin tip there. And then we've got the bottom round or known as silver side. Take some of that silver skin off. And if we do a cross cut of this, just to give an example, I'm gonna pull this piece of fat out first. So that holds the uh, popliteal or popliteal gland, as well as some of this, what we call the heel meat. That's good for uh, stewing. Grazing has a lot of uh, collagen tendinous pieces in there. And this is a nice flat cut. So now we've got a nice uh, bottom round, which contains the flat and the eye of round. Keeping that hole is great. Keeping this muscle hole is great. And uh, also the uh, sirloin tip. I like that for kebab meat. It makes a great, wonderful, flavorful kebab if we marinate that and just cube that up real nice. Chef, you are, uh, you are, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in a, go ahead. I'm sorry, say that again. No, I was just, I was just uh, going to ask a, a follow-up question. You know, you have uh, so many cuts and different fabrications on your on your bread and presentation. Um, so, what are some tips or even you know tricks or um, that you can give to chefs purchasing or customers purchasing with lamb? Uh, probably the best tip is is get familiar with your meat buyer's guide. Uh, all your major cuts, sub cuts, as well as secondary or portion cuts and terminologies uh, would be found in those. So this goes back to that sewing point, you know, educating the consumer and guests in exactly. terms of the land. Absolutely, Chef. Exactly. Get with your local distributor. Oftentimes your distributor may have a center of the plate specialist that specifies uh, with uh, proteins that can help guide uh, some of those choices as well. Uh, suggest or advise on where to, where to go for things on educational tools and resources for consumers as well as culinarians alike. I'm wonderful, Chef. And uh, we kind of to parlay into the next question from Chef Kellogg. Um, what are some of the ways in your personal experience that you've educated your consumers um, uh, as well? I've done a variety of educational uh, seminars 
both for consumers and culinarians locally here with Colorado ACF, uh, as well as different organizations. Here, I'm just gonna remove this blank or this, what we call thin meats, right to that 13th rib bone there. There we go. Set that aside. And in this application, we're gonna get a couple of different unique cuts just to mix it up. Again, we're down in the sacral region by the tailbone there, separating the loin saddle and the leg. And out of this, we're gonna get some thick cut uh, loin, lamb loin chops, the equivalent of a T-bone or a porterhouse. Clean up some of this here. Get some of this veil or call fat. That's a thick suet. You want to leave a little bit in for flavor, but not too much. And then here, let's get some. This would probably be like the equivalent of those double lamb uh, rib chops that we got from the rack. We could call this uh, lamb loin Fiorentina, like Bisteca Fiorentina. Okay. Those large uh, cuts from Italy. That would be the humongous, you know, 40 or 50 ounce T-bone. And Chef, speaking of like the Bisteca and, and things like that, um, like, do you see lamb more utilized in the United States or is it more, you know, uh, more integral in global cuisine as well? I think both. Um, and again, as culinarians, as we begin to uh, educate ourselves more on different cuts and things like that and offerings of what we can bring to the proverbial table, we have a variety of presentations that work well, again, factoring what's going to work well for you. Do you have somebody that can fabricate uh, those boneless cuts, take the time to do that? Or is it much easier to simply do some preparations like this? Again, thinking of whole large kind of bone-in cuts and family style or community, communal tables. This here. What is this cut right now, Chef? This here, we're taking the, um, working back on the leg with the sirloin end and what they call the shank path. Wonderful. And Chef, what, uh, what, what, what made you become interested in lamb? And, and, and what, what qualifications uh, with somebody who is interested in lamb, or what would they need to go through uh, in terms of education or certification uh, to primarily get to your level? You know, um, education never stops. And I think it starts with yourself and, and the resources available to us. And I think that starts with the American Land Board curriculum, as we mentioned before. Uh, also the Meat Buyer's Guide, uh, North American Meat Processors and the American uh, Meat Association uh, has a slew of resources. Uh, furthering that, you know, there's a lot of uh, ag programs across the U.S., uh, meat sciences and things along those lines if they really wanted to get into it. And uh, after that, I would say find a local butcher sure. that is doing some whole carcass butchery and um, if stodging or uh, applying to learn as an apprentice uh, to further that education is an integral part of all of that. 
here we're gonna do kind of a boneless version. Get back down in there. And Chef, while you're, while you're working on that cut, um, we are almost a little close to three, but it's okay if we go a little over. Um, at this time, uh, I like to launch the second poll. And to uh, the chefs out there, how many dishes do you have on your menu that utilize lamb? So go ahead and, and uh, click the poll function at the end, or excuse me, the bottom of your screen. And uh, let's see what we've, what we've got. So we, the questions or answers range, Chef, between one lamb dish to two to multiple. Um, we're, Good. we're pretty even spread. Uh, this is wonderful. That's great. So we can see that that lamb is um, being heavily utilized in our industry, which is wonderful. Excellent. That's one of those things that you can engage your staff. You know, maybe it's it's once a month or once a week if you have the time for you and your team to bring in a new cut and work on that or maybe work on that for an entire quarter and that's the feature uh, on the menu for that for that month or that quarter or whatever time period that works again within your departmental schedules yeah. here we're going to do a whole lamb leg of a roast working along this hip or age bone. Remove that out. There we go. And I left the shank meat in this instance. What we want to do is I'm keeping this leg whole, pull this apart. That's the top round there, the bottom round underneath here, the knuckle. And I'm going to where all that meets. Basically, the shank portion here. There's that little white piece of fat, that popliteal gland. I take that out. It leaves a uh, unpleasant taste if you bite into it. So we're just going to take that out. And in this instance, I'm going to take the shank meat and fold that right into the center. This would be an application where I was going to cook it beyond rare and do a slow and low barbecue style application or long uh, live fire cooking application where it's going to cook slowly for six hours. And we're just going to roll that back up like so. And do a uh, whole boneless uh, shank and leg, which contains all the lovely cuts referred to as TBS or top bottom sirloin. Sometimes you'll see that TBS term used when ordering a boneless leg three-way, meaning that the leg has been butterflied into the muscles of uh, the top, bottom, and sirloin separately. There we go, we've got a little bit of unevenness, but there we go. Chef, uh, before we, we end this presentation, um, there's just been a multitude of questions. I, I apologize to the audience for not being no, able to, to give all. them all, um, get to them all. They, these are a wealth of great questions. Um, so, Chef, you, you did speak about, you know, economic sustainable, economically sustainable uh, lamb. Um, where, where do you see that, you know, um, how important is that to be sustainable? Um, you know, that's used as a buzzword a lot of times, you know, now, especially in our industry to be sustainable. So what does that really mean in terms of the land? You know, I think sustainability is not only in the raising and rearing, but being fiscally sound. And going back to, again, I, I can't say enough, those, those questions of what's applicable and relevant in your, in your operation and what's going to work well within your means. Does it mean bringing in a whole carcass? Maybe not. Uh, maybe it's just bringing in the economical cuts uh, that are bone in or fabricated in a state that is easily manageable by you and your team. So I think, you know, while butchery is cool and, and trendy and all, you know, we have to be fiscally responsible and mindful to ourselves and our departments and our operations as a whole. We've got a nice little, uh, 
whole boneless leg roast there. Uh, there are some other tools that make this a lot quicker from a labor standpoint, uh, referred to as a jet netter. It's kind of a big metal cone ranging in price from about 100 to 150, maybe $200 on the high end. And then you would take the netting and kind of peel that over. And rather than tying all that, you just kind of form the roast and shove it through and, and it's all pretty, comes out netted and ready to, ready to rock and roll. That leg cut there. Take our bone. There, it's there. And again, working on the sirloin end now. We do have a little piece of the tenderloin. I left that in this section. I'm gonna do another boneless version. Following that hip bone underneath. I've peeled back the tenderloin, the, the butt end or the head, if you will. It's the thicker end of the tenderloin. And there we go. And getting just under that joint. Working with the tip of my knife. There. Take that bone. Set that there. Lay these out so we can kind of see some of the differences. If we were to separate this out, we can do some great little sirloin cuts. Trim this down. And again, do some nice, great grilling sirloin pieces. And oftentimes what you might see too is they may take from the processor, uh, they may take two boneless sirloin, top sirloin pieces and close those together and such. Um, in all, one of the uh, things is, is doing what works best for your operation. Um, again, I can't say enough how much the uh, American Land Board resource website is a tremendous value to any culinarians or consumers, has a great slew of information that is easily digestible by any professional or home enthusiast or just somebody who loves lamb. And if they're not a fan of lamb already, just try it. It's that simple. Thank you so much. The last thing I wanted to say is a uh, uh, wrap up literally wrap and roll with uh, some thin meats and a classic dish called wuladen, uh, which is a, a slow cooked braised thin meats application. You could stuff that, uh, tie this up and sear that, braise that a really long time and serve it with some nice uh, starch, a nice uh, sauce made from the drippings in the pan sauce itself uh, to make a classic rouladon. It's one of the great butcher cuts, if you will, and, and classics. Uh, uh, a friend of mine who's a longtime butcher here in Denver, when we were talking about the thin meats, and he says, oh yeah, rouladon, that's something that's old, and it transcends mm -hmm. a lot of different uh, cuisines. Chef Danetis, thank you so much. Uh, this was a tremendous presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your expertise. A huge virtual round of applause as we thank Chef for a great presentation and demonstration. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to share your insights, advice, and expertise. We understand that um, you know to be able to do what you do, it takes a, a large level of expertise and education. So we thank you for, for your time today, Chef. On um, the ACF, at the ACF, we hear you. Uh, we hope that you will join us for our next webinar on June 9th. Where we, where we will learn focus on anxiety at work as chefs share strategies to help kitchen teams build resilience, handle uncertainty, and get stuff done. 
For more inspiration in culinary news and to register for upcoming webinars, please check out our site, wearechefs.com. And please remember to fill out the survey you'll receive tomorrow in order to receive your one culinary educator um, award for attending this webinar. Um, on behalf of ACF National Office, myself, Ashton Garrett, thank you again to the American Land Board and Chef Danettis for a tremendous opportunity um, and great presentation. And for all of you for joining us today. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon and hope that you'll join us in Orlando this summer for the ACF National Convention. Thank you all and have a blessed and wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.